Guys, okay, so welcome back to our on organic chemistry online lectures. And this time we're going to look at how to give names for ethers. So just to give you a brief background of what are ethers. So these are organic molecules having this type of connectivity. So you have your C or a carbon bonded to your oxygen. And this oxygen is also bonded to your carbon atom. Now this carbon atom, in this case here, can be imagined as an alkyl group. So this alkyl group is bonded to your oxygen atom, and this, this carbon here can also imagine as another alkyl group. So if we have the same type of alkyl groups bonded to the same at or oxygen atom, so we call them your symmetrical ethers. But if you have unlike alkyl groups, or not similar alkyl groups bonded to oxygen atom, then that those are called unsymmetrical ethers. Now, other types of ethers exist in cyclic structures. This is the simplest cyclic ether. This is known as your epoxide. So we're gonna look at the namings for these types of ethers in this video. Naming of ethers in substitutive IUPAC in nomenclature, ethers are named as alkoxy derivatives of alkanes. So alkoxy, so the alkyl group becomes alkoxy groups. So in this case, if you have a CH3O, this is known as your methoxy group. If you have, for example, a CH3CH2O group that is named as your ethoxy group. So if you have three carbon atom and an oxygen that is known as your propoxy group. So you can just imagine or yeah, the names of the other uh, alkoxy groups as the number of carbon increases. So if we have five carbon atom and an oxygen, that will become your pentoxy group. How do we give names for alkane? So let's for for ether. So let's take a look at this this molecule. So this is named in substitutive IUPAC as ethoxy ethane. So this group is your epoxy, and you have two the alkane group becomes ethane. Okay, so the other way of naming this is using the functional class nomenclature. We list the two alkyl groups in the structure in alphabetical order as separate words. So for example, okay, you have here your ethyl group and ethyl group, so it's named as diethyl ether. So another example, in substitutive nomenclature, this one is named as methoxy. This one is your methoxy. and Ethane. But in functional class nomenclature, we just write the names of the alkyl groups separately in alphabetical precedence and append the word ether. So in this case, it becomes ethyl methyl ether. For cyclic ethers, you have some few examples here. So in this case, okay, the presence of an oxygen is actually signified by the word or the prefix oxa. So in this case, we have oxacyclopropane or oxirane. In some textbooks, they call this one as ethylene oxide. This is a popular name for this molecule, ethylene oxide. Now, in this case, you have here oxacyclobutane or oxethane. Now, it's quite trivial because if you have here a carbon instead of an oxygen, this one is named as cyclobutane. But since you replace one carbon with an oxygen, then this one becomes oxacyclobutane. Using the same manner, if we have five carbon atom cyclic molecule that is called cyclopentane, but in this case we replace one of the carbon atoms with an oxygen, so we call this molecule or the cyclic ether as oxacyclopentane. Now we have a special name for this molecule. Okay, this is named as tetrahydrofuran or simply THF. Now, what if I replace, for example, two carbon atoms with an oxygen? So in this case, I use the prefix di to denote that there are two carbon atoms 
replaced with an oxygen. Again, an ox the presence of an oxygen is signified with the prefix oxa. So this one is named as dioxacyclohexane. Okay, so let's look at how to give names for alkenes and cycloalkenes. So just like what we've learned for alkenes and cycloalkenes, we will actually use those rules with some modifications. And the first rule will be about naming or choosing the parent. Now in choosing the parent hydrocarbon chain, we have to select the longest chain that contains the carbon-carbon double bond. And if we put the name of the alkene, the name should end in E and E instead of A and E. Now, the second rule tells us actually how to number the carbon, the parent chain uh, with respect to the carbon-carbon double bond. So the rule here is to number the, uh, the chain, the at the end nearest the carbon-carbon double bond that will actually give the carbon-carbon double bond the lowest possible locant. Now, you can assign the location of the carbon-carbon double bond by using the number of the first atom of the carbon-carbon double bond as the prefix. Now, you can write the locant of the, for the alkene suffix before the parent name or it can be placed immediately before the suffix. So we have some examples to show this. Okay, let's look at this one. So we have here a four carbon alkene, so that is actually butene. So again, we replace the A and E and with, with E and E to signify that this molecule is a butene. In a second rule, it states that we have to number the chain at the end nearest the carbon carbon double bond. And in this molecule, we number it starting from this carbon. So carbons one, two, three, and four. So the overall name for this one is one butene. Now you notice in the final name, you have the locant one to signify that the carbon carbon double bond started at carbon number one. Now take note that this molecule is not named as three butene. Now let's look at a longer hydrocarbon alkene. In this case, we have six carbon atoms in a parent chain and that corresponds to your hexene. Again, we drop the A and E and replace this one with E and E. In the second rule, we have to number this in such a manner that the carbon-carbon double bond will have the lowest possible set of locals or will have the lowest number. Doing that one, we have to number this at the end nearest the carbon-carbon double bond and it is on the left side. So if you look at this one, so this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this one is named as to hexene. Again, the locant two here signifies that the carbon carbon double bond started at carbon number two. This name for hexene is an incorrect name for this molecule. All right, so we have here another rule that tells us how to give names for branched alkanes. So in this case, we have to indicate the location of the substituent groups by the number of the carbons to which they are attached. So for example, in this case, we have your four carbon alkene. So this is butene. And you notice that the carbon carbon double bond started at carbon number two. So this is, so the parent becomes two butene. You also recognize here at carbon number two of the parent chain, we have a branch point. And this branch point is a methyl group. So when you write the final name of this one, this is named as 2-methyl-2-butene. All right, so we have here another example. Now, the first thing we have to do here is to find the parent chain. And we have some rules to do that one. First, the parent chain should be the longest continuous carbon chain or the chain that contains the most number of carbon. And the second thing that will guide us is that the double bond should be in the al alkyl chain. So obviously this is our parent chain and this has six carbon atoms, hence we have hexene. Now the next thing we have to do is to number this alkyl chain in such a manner that the carbon-carbon double bond will receive the lowest possible set of locants. To do that one, we have to number the alkyl chain at the end nearest the carbon-carbon double bond and this one would tell us that we have to number it starting from this carbon. So when we count from here, this becomes one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, north is at carbons two and carbon five, we have 
branch points or we have substituents and we recognize that these are methyl substituents so again just like what we did for cyclo for alkenes or cycloalkenes for that matter if we have the same type of substituents then we have to use some prefixes such as di tri tetra and so on and so forth now in this case we have two similar types of your methyl groups hence we use di methyl the third rule tells us that we also have to indicate the location or the locant of the substituents so we know that at carbon 2 and 5 we have the methyl groups here so if we write the final name for this one the name will be 2,5 dimethyl 2 hexene now please remember that numbers are separated by a comma and a number and a letter or a word is separated by a dash. I hope you understand why 2,5-dimethyl for hexene is an incorrect way of naming this molecule. Well, the answer for this one, or the reason why this way of naming of this molecule is incorrect is because we actually started numbering at the end farthest the carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, so let's look at how to give names for cycloalkenes. Now, cycloalkenes are similar to your cycloalkenes. The only difference is that for cycloalkenes, they have a carbon-carbon double bond. And for cycloalkenes, the carbon-carbon double bond is automatically carbons one and two. And we should number the ring in such a way that it will give us the lowest possible set of locants. Now let's try to illustrate this one in this following example. So we have here a cycloalkene with a six-membered ring and that is cyclohexene. Again, you notice we drop the A and E and replace that one with E and E. For cycloalkenes, this carbon-carbon double bond here is carbons one and carbon two and we have to number this one in such a way that it will give us the lowest possible set of locants. Doing so, we have to number this one in a clockwise manner. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we notice that at carbons three and carbon five, we have methyl substituents. So we write the final name as 3,5-dimethylcyclohexene. Now take note that we, I use again this prefix di to indicate I have two similar types of, or the same types of substituents. All right, so I hope you understand why this molecule 4,6-dimethylcyclohexene is an incorrect way of naming this molecule. Now let's take a look at alkenes that contain an alcohol group or a hydroxy group. These are actually called alkenols if you have a straight chain or a branch chain alkene with an alcohol group, or cycloalkenols if you have a cyclic alkene containing an OH group. Now, giving names for these types of molecules, the priority is no longer in the carbon-carbon double bond, but the priority is in the carbon that is attached to the alcohol group. So when I say the carbon bonded to the OH group as the priority, what I mean is we should start numbering from that carbon. So we can actually have this as an example. So we have here a six-membered alkene, and this carbon is attached to an OH group, so this carbon becomes the priority. Now, when we start numbering the cycloalkene, we have to ensure that the carbon-carbon double bond will still get the lowest possible set of locant. So we have to number this one in a clockwise manner and not on a counterclockwise manner. So in this case, we have carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now take note for this molecule, we also have a methyl group that is attached to carbon number 2. So we also have to include this one obviously in our final name of the molecule. Now, the thing that we have to do is how to write the parent name for this one. So obviously this is no longer a cyclohexene because it contains an alcohol group. So this is now named as a cycloalkenols. So the end is actually an OL to denote that this is 
a cycloalkenone. So the parent becomes two cyclohexane one ol. So notice that we have here the hexane meaning there is six carbon atoms in the cyclohexene ring, and we have here one all to denote that the hydroxyl functional group is bonded to carbon number one. Now the double bond in the parent is actually designated by the locant two before the parent. Now, if we write the final name for this one, this becomes two methyl two cyclohexane one all. Or you can write the final name for this molecule as 2-methylcyclohex-2N1-ol. So this is another way of naming the parent. All right, so with, let's look at another example. So we have here an alkenol. So first rule is to find the longest continuous carbon chain. And we have here... This one that is five carbons, that is pentene. Now we have to recognize as well that in this molecule, aside from the carbon-carbon double bond, we have a hydroxyl functional group. And we have stated or learned in rule four that between the OH and the double bond, the OH is the priority. So meaning the carbon bearing the OH should have a lower locant than the carbon-carbon double bond. So there's only one way for me to number this one, okay? So I will start from here. So carbon one, two, three, four, and five. Numbering in that manner will lead me to this carbon having still a lower set of locant than this carbon carbon double bond here again how do we write the parent for this one so the parent is pentene two all two here is the locant telling us that the hydroxyl group is bonded to carbon number two now notice that we have the locant three before the parent pentene so this tells us that the double bond alkene starts at carbon number three. And at carbon number four, we have a methyl group. So we have a substituent. So we write that one as four methyl. Now take note that we can also write the parent as pent 3 n 2 o This is another acceptable way of naming this compound. All right, so sometimes we have some groups that you would see quite often as we go along the study of organic nomenclature. The first one is called the vinyl group. So in this case, we have a CH2CH, and this is also called an ethenyl group. Okay, so if we see this group, this, is, this can be named as ethenyl cyclopropane, or sometimes we can also name this one as vinyl or vinyl cyclopropane. We have another closely similar group here, and this one is called the allyl group. So an allyl group is actually a CH2, CH, CH2. So this is almost similar with this one. The only difference is that you have an extra CH2 for the allyl group. Now, the IUPAC name for this one is PROP2N1IL or allyl. Okay, so let's look at this molecule here so again we have here a cycloalkane this is not a cyclohexene because this one doesn't have any double bond and we have a hydroxyl group and a double bond here so this is actually a substituent now between this versus this one the priority is actually the hydroxyl functional group so that means we have to start numbering up this carbon and we can number the ring in such a way that this group will still have the lowest possible set of locant. So I can do that one if I number this ring in a clockwise manner. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So the name for this molecule can be written as three, prop two n. 1L cyclohexan 1L. Okay, so this one is the parent. The cyclohexan 1L is the parent. And at position number three or at locant number three, we have an allyl substituent or 
PROP2N1L. Now you can simply just call this molecule as 3 allyl cyclohexanol. All right, so I'll now introduce cis and trans naming of alkenes. So we have actually discussed cis and trans isomerism for cycloalkanes in the previous discussion. So let's try to apply the concepts of cis and trans for naming alkenes. So again, when you say cis, they are the groups that are identical or substantial groups are on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond. In contrast, if we have trans, then the identical or substantial groups are on opposite sides of the carbon-carbon double bond. I think it's better for us to have some examples for this one. Okay, now let's look at this first example here. So we have here a very simple molecule, just two carbon alkenes, that is ethene. Now, at carbons one and carbon two, we have here a chloro derivative, so we have dichloro. Now, we have to write the location or the locant of the chlorine substituents, and that is simply at carbons one and two. That's why we have one, two dichloroethene. Now, why do we have cis here? Cis because the chlorines can be imagined as on the same side of the molecule. You can actually imagine this, for example, drawing a line here, and you would notice that the chlorine atoms are on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond. Now, in contrast, if we have the chlorine atoms on opposite side, for example, we have a trans-1 to dichloroethene. All right, so let's try to apply what we've learned so far by using this example. Now we have this molecule, so the first thing we have to do is to choose the parent chain. Now what are the rules again that we learned in choosing the parent chain? So remember the parent chain should have the most number of carbon atoms. And secondly, for alkenes, the parent chain should contain the carbon-carbon double bond. So for this molecule, we have four options here. So this is the first option, letter A, six carbon atoms, but what is wrong with letter A? Okay, the, carb, the longest continuous carbon chain does not contain a double bond. So this one is no longer in our list. Now look at letter B. So in this case, we have seven carbon atoms. Again, the double bond is not on the main chain, so this is still not our parent chain. Now focus your attention on letter C. So we have here a seven carbon alkene, and this one contains the double bond. So this could be a, the parent chain. However, if you look at letter D here, we also have a seven alkene carbon, and this parent chain still contains the double bond. So the thing is, we have to break the tie between C and D, and we can break the tie if we know how to number the parent chain. The second rule tells us that the carbon-carbon double bond should actually have the lowest possible set of locants, or we should start numbering the alkyl chain at the end nearest the carbon-carbon double bond, and that ultimately may letter D as our parent chain. We have to write the complete name. So notice that at carbon number two, we have a methyl group. And at carbon number four of the parent chain, we have here a third butyl group. So if we write the final name for this will be four third butyl two methyl one heptene. Again, write first the parent chain. So this becomes one heptene. Notice that the A and E is dropped, and this one is replaced by E and E to denote that this molecule is an alkene. Notice that in the, this name as well, we have to write the position of the double bond, and that is at carbon number one. And take note that when we write the substituents in the final name, this substituent should be following an alphabetical precedence. 
third is not included for alphabetization as what we've learned in the naming of alkanes and cycloalkanes. Okay, so the last topic for this video is how to give names for alkynes. Now for alkynes, we have to replace the E and E with Y and E to denote it is an alkyne. So similar to alkenes, we have to find the longest continuous carbon chain containing the triple bond, and that will become the parent. So in this case, we have a seven alkyne carbon atom, and that is heptine. Now take note that I drop here the E and E and replace that one with Y and just to denote that this one is an alkyne. We have to number this in such a way that the triple bond will receive the lowest possible set of locons. Or in other words, I will number this alkyl chain at the end nearest the carbon-carbon triple bond. And in writing the final name, I have to indicate the location of the triple bond. So the final name for this molecule will be to heptine. What if, if we have, for example, a bromo substituent? The triple bond is the priority, meaning I will start numbering at the carbon-carbon triple bond. And in doing that, I will have one, two, three, and four. So the final name for this one is 4-bromo-1-butyne. Now take note, parent is 1-butyne, 4-carbon atom, that is butyne. Now, where is my triple bond located? It, it is at carbon, or it starts at carbon number one. That's why we have one butyne. And at carbon number four, we have a bromo substituent. So this is named as 4-bromo-1-butyne. All right, so let's try to analyze the name for this molecule. So the first thing we have to do is to choose the parent chain and again we have similar rules for alkenes that the parent chain should contain the most number of carbon atoms and this parent chain should contain the triple bond now when we number the chain it should start at the end nearest the triple bond so in this case we start numbering the chain on the side doing that one we have one two going to ten so that is the sign now we have to put the location of the triple bond and this is at carbon number three. Hence the parent is three design. Now the next step for us is to identify the substituents. So at carbon number six, we have an isopropyl group, seven, an iodo group, eight, a uh, methyl group, and at carbon number nine, we have a bromo group. Now, when we write the substituents in the final name, we have to make sure that these substituents are in alphabetical order, and we should also indicate the locant or the lo carbon to which the uh, substituents are attached to the parent chain. So in this case, the final name will be nine bromo, seven iodo, six isopropyl, 8-methyl-3 design. All right, so sometimes in a triple bond, we also have the presence of a hydroxyl group. So similarly, how do we give names for this? Just like what we did for alkenes, the carbon bearing the hydroxyl group is priority or a higher priority than the carbon carbon triple bond. So that means we have to number the chain at the end nearest the OH or at the carbon bearing the hydroxyl group. So in this case, I will number the molecule or the parent chain starting from this carbon going to the left. So in this case, I will have one, two, three. And not this at carbon number three, we have a triple bond that goes to carbon number four. So the final name will be three butyne one all. Again, in the final name for this one, we have the locant one to signify that the alcohol group or the hydroxy group is connected to carbon number one of the parent chain. And at carbon number three, we have here the location of the triple bond. Notice that the EN is replaced with YN to signify the molecule is an alkyne. Now try to think why this way of numbering is actually wrong. So in this case, it is wrong because the carbon bearing the OH is of higher priority than the carbon-carbon 
triple bond. All right, so let's look at a longer molecule here. So we have a eight carbon alkyne, and that is octyne, but this one has the presence of hydroxyl group. So this one is named as an alkynol. So when we number the parent chain, again, we have to remember that we have to number this at the end nearest the OH group because we have an OH which has a higher priority than the triple bond. So I will number starting on this carbon. So we have carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So the parent name for this one is five octyne two all. So if we look at this one closely, we have here the locant, which is two. That is to indicate the position of the hydroxyl group at carbon number two of the parent chain. And before the, the word octane, we have here the locant five to indicate that the carbon-carbon triple bond started at carbon number five. Then obviously we have here a substituent at carbon number two, which is a methyl group. So the final name for this one is 2 methyl 5 octane 2 all. Now, in this case, we have a wrong way of numbering the alkyl chain. So remember that between the hydroxyl functional group and the triple bond, the priority is the hydroxyl group. So that means I will start numbering at the end nearest the carbon bearing the OH group. Mm -hmm.